Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, my dear friends. I would like to thank you all for joining uh, the International Peace Institute in MENA's event, Energy Security in the MENA and Beyond. The conflict in Ukraine will undoubtedly have the most challenging geopolitical consequences of a war waged by not only a military superpower, but at the same time, an energy superpower. Hardly recovering from COVID-19 pandemic, the world is now struggling to cope with the one month old world that is exhuming all the grievances. The humanitarian and material losses of the war are, the war is causing in Ukraine are deplored and condemned as any other form of acts of war and occupation we are still witnessing around the globe and in our region. We reiterate our solidarity with the people of Ukraine and all other people's victims of aggression, violence, and violations of territorial uh, integrity and international law. I will not elaborate on the dramatic changes, upheavals, and upheavals this war will have on the global political, strategic, and economic orders. However, we will focus on those concerning its dramatic effects on the energy security in the MENA region and beyond as the conflict is evolving. You will tell me that this is part of the economic uh, com components or effects of the war. Other MENA, me, other MENA, MENA countries, however, are important importers of Russian oil products in addition to vital food items. As we today gather to further dig into the ramifications of this conflict in this region and some of its countries are oil producers to whom many eyes are looking to fill any gap left by uh, the strategic Russian supply subject to sanctions. We are facing challenging scenarios in some MENA countries with hardly any resilience to tackle the consequences of energy imports uh, bills. Many of these countries and states may face unprecedented unrest. Now, too many questions regarding the consequences of the upheaval are on this table and our table. How critical, and in, how critical an ingredient is energy security to peace, stability, and sustainable development? Of course, peace has been sh shattered. To what extent will energy security or the lack thereof affect the ultimate objective of achieving sustainable development and durable peace? We are witnessing the demise, I would put it in terms of question, are we witnessing really the demise of Ostpolitik symbolized by the halt of the $11 billion North Stream 2 gas pipeline? is just one of the most visible signs of the rapid realignment underway as a result of the conflict. To what extent will this conflict create the opportunity for new alliances within a very likely new world energy order? As customs are boycotting Russia, Will its partnership with the oil titans of the Middle East, which, with which it jointly leads the OPEC plus coalition, will that stay intact? We are all aware that Russia and Saudi Arabia are the world top oil exporters. 
accounting for almost 30% of the global output. What will the global energy order look like? Will additional oil and gas customers desert Russia? How much of centrality energy will be or will play in our societies? How will these dramatic developments impact poor populations in developing countries? To what extent will this challenge lead to opportunities to convert to alternative renewable sources of energy, as most Arab countries have or are in the process of creating a viable market for renewable energy investments. Would the need for energy transition in this region be inevitable? To what extent will regional cooperation in the MENA region contribute to regional security? Will the efforts of hydrogen lead to success? What about some efforts by some countries to resort to nuclear power? Too many questions. You agree with me, my friends. That need to be answered. And with, with them, the concerns of both public and official opinions in the region. Needless to say that we at the International Peace Institute, Middle East and North Africa, IPI MENA, we aim to promote regional integration in the Middle East and North Africa, of course. Energy security is a, fund a foundational component to ensuring stability, prosperity, and therefore peace and sustainable development. This webinar is a timely opportunity, I think, to gather prominent experts and observers and diplomats who are heralding a new wave of energy initiatives to build, to build sustainable tomorrow. Together we convene to understand what the next steps for our, regions, our region are. I am delighted and honored to share the floor and to invite, in fact, to prominent guests. First, Mr. Ahmed Darwish, an energy expert, graduate in geophysics from Tusukuba University, Japan, former general manager of Petrofac Tunisia, founder of H2J to produce green hydrogen in Tunisia for the Italian market, and lately founded the H2JH UB NGO in Tunisia and Egypt. Second, Mr. Nimal Vallipuram. Nimal of GCC Group, JCC Group, is an experienced investor, fundraiser, and strategic advisor to companies in uh, environment, social, and governance, ESG, and technology space. He was one of the first analysts to start covering ESG related topics and stocks in the US financial markets. He is an active participant in numerous media and web-based platforms as a commentator on ESG transition and related global trends. I will ask Ahmed to uh, deliver his uh, remarks to kick off this debate to which I invite all of you diplomats uh, media and other participants to uh, take part. Thank you so much. Ahmed, you have the floor. Najib, you have to, do you hear me? We hear you loud and clear. Okay, okay. thank you very much, uh, Najib, for this introduction. I think, uh, yes, the subject, uh, Time-wise and location-wise is very important and it's a very hot uh, topic uh, these days. And uh, it's very uh, good to understand uh, what's going on uh, from uh, uh, an energy point of view, if you relate it or you link it to the actual war, which is like then three, more than three weeks now ongoing. I have to remind everyone 
that in October or November 2021, there is no war, but there was a gas crisis in Europe. So um, the oil and gas was really in uh, an increasing cramp, and the prices are uh, growing up. As Najib said very well, after recovering from the COVID, uh, which really stacked all the uh, world for uh, most than one and a half year, actually, and that the growth very close to zero, even negative in some locations. Let me give you uh, a screenshot on what's going on right now. So you, you, you will be familiar with them. The current oil price averagely as per this morning are uh, almost around $100 plus minus few cents. $100 uh, 10 days ago was 130 uh, for uh, dated brand. The current gas price in the US market is around 1.75 million the BTU for dollars. It's almost 20 times in Europe. 1 million BTU in the US, it's 4.75 and it's almost $80 in Europe. The average of the OEPIC basket as per today is around $103, the barrel. LNG, liquefied natural gas, Japan and Korean market today is around $38 the million BTU. The aim of uh, the world up to the end of 2021 is producing and consuming around 100 million barrel a day. That's, that's probably the prospect uh, for 2022 after uh, the end of the, the COVID uh, problem. So two, $3 million uh, barrels up or down will really let the price struggle. And uh, we are 99 million barrel. Uh, you know, OEPIC uh, countries are the most biggest stake, but still below the 50% of the total production of the world. But Saudi, uh, Arabia, uh, US, uh, Russia are the biggest producer today in, uh, in the markets of oil and gas worldwide. I have a number I have to tell you about it is what's documented as proven reserves at the end of 2020. It's 1,732,000 million of barrel of oil still not produced. I repeat the number, it's 1,732,000 million of barrel not produced yet, proven reserves. Out of that, 50% are in the Middle East. 50% are in the Middle East. 33% are in all Americas, South America, Central America, and North America. And North America, the biggest producer is the US, of course. Uh, around 9% is coming from the CIS, or Russian mainly. And 0.8% in Europe. When you said 0.8% in Europe, including North Sea. So the European dependence on the Nord Stream, the gas Nord Stream from Russia, it's, it's, it's obvious. And uh, I don't think uh, for the moment any cut actually on supplying gas Europe from the Nord Stream uh, gas on Russia uh, will stop. This will be a big mess actually for Europe if this pipeline stops feeding gas. And I'm not talking about today and tomorrow. I'm talking about next winter. You know, contracts for next winter are, 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 are bargained now, are discussed now. So next winter in Europe will be September, October 2022. And they have to secure this 50 BCM, billion cubic meter of gas. They have to come through a pipeline because that's the cheapest way how to bring gas to Europe. It's gas from the pipeline. There are some gas coming from Algeria, from North Africa. Do you hear me, Najib? I think I lost your face. And uh, you hear me? Okay. Of course, and, we hear uh, you. 
go ahead. Yeah, okay, sorry, because the picture has disappeared. And uh, so uh, uh, there are a lot of gas coming from, uh, from Algeria uh, through the pipelines, which uh, lie to Italy and to Spain. But this is really a small comparing to what Russia is feeding Europe so far. So I think despite uh, the war and the language and the communication, what we can see in the news and so, that is a continuous pipeline feeding Europe with natural gas and crossing Ukraine. So this is uh, the screenshot what's going on right now. So how I see it, I will talk about uh, North, uh, I mean, MENA area, and I will leave the beyond to Naimal afterward. How I see it, I, I, I see it like a matrix, a square matrix of three lines and three rows. The three lines, I will divide the MENA area to North Africa, which mainly Mauritania, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and Libya. This is one block. The second block is the Middle East, what I call the Middle East, which is mainly Eastern, including Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, uh, Jordan, and uh, Palestine, Israel. And the last piece is the Gulf, the Gulf countries. So these are the three main blocks on the MENA and, and, and the main area. And I will speak how they react to three commodities, oil, gas, and what's done in renewable energy so far. So if I start with North Africa, in the country, in the, among the countries of North Africa, there are two producers, big producers, which are Algeria, mainly gas, and Libya. Despite the situation in Libya, it's not picking up yet to the normal production before the war. And the other uh, countries, Morocco and Tunisia and uh, less Mauritania, they are not called the producer country. They are not. They, they produce a small quantity. Uh, high oil price, it's definitely for the benefit of Algeria and Libya but it's very bad and dangerous for Tunisia, Morocco, and Mauritania. Uh, because these countries, Tunisia, Morocco, and Mauritania, they they almost importing the refined product, which is gasoline, diesel, and so. There's one big refinery in Morocco, it's closed, the Samir one, and the, but they are importing uh, all this country. And usually when they import, they import through uh, a long-time contract or a yearly contract. And there are a lot of, uh, I will say, uh, Black Sea products on the Mediterranean. Uh, there are a lot of uh, big Russian company also operating in the Mediterranean uh, on the products. So uh, the prices are uh, going very high, uh, but also uh, the fingerprints of the product and where it's coming from will be a serious issue to consider. And they have to make it clear how they're gonna make their supplies viable and not subject to any sanction if there are any sanction coming in the future. So uh, this is uh, uh, on oil and gas. Algeria is a big gas uh, producer and gas exporter through three pipelines to Europe. And they have uh, uh, several energy also uh, ports and they export their energy worldwide. So uh, on renewable, energy as a transition, as a compensation for electricity. Morocco is doing very well. Uh, they have uh, developed a lot of projects, mainly in solar and then wind. And lately they have enough idea on green hydrogen for producing green ammonia for export to Europe. I think Morocco is doing very well on this side. Uh, the others, Tunisia and Libya, they are very delayed. Uh, I can, uh, we can see now Algeria issuing some ITTs uh, for uh, renewable solar project in uh, the south, which is encouraging, but I think they, they would need it to decarbonize also the oil and gas uh, uh, business. Let's move to the second block, which is the Middle East, which is, I, as I said, it's Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, and uh, Israel and Palestine. Uh, the oil price, the current oil price for the moment is not good for them, for all of them. Uh, despite the oil production in Egypt, which is quite high, but the market is very big. So it's absorbing a lot of, uh, of products and uh, uh, 
uh, I I think uh, Egypt has to. They have they have an equilibrium price which should be around fifty to fifty five dollars a barrel, but oil price is not definitely good for for all of them. So. Uh, uh, they have to monitor the oil price for the moment. I think they will have a serious impact on the yearly budget. Uh, however, on renewable, there are two countries that are doing fantastic. It's Egypt and Jordan. And uh, they have a lot of investment in uh, renewable energy, solar, wind. Uh, I think Jordan and Egypt, uh, they, we should be proud of what they are doing so far. Uh, to uh, to feed their grids with uh, renewable energy and to 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 decrease to uh, decrease their uh, their need on final refined product, uh, I think we have to follow this very carefully and uh, we have to encourage them and uh, see the prices of electricity in this country, especially Egypt, because it's a huge market and some uh, some of the electricity, most of it is subsidized. So. Um, that's that's a good uh, thing to to hear from the Middle East. Uh, transition wise, Egypt is doing fantastic. They are investing a lot of renewable and uh, green hydrogen projects are coming to the table. No FID so far, but a lot of intentions are uh, already uh, on the table. So uh, this is something uh, which uh, we have also to uh, highlight. Uh, let me move uh, to the uh, third block, which is, I think, the most important block uh, in terms of the subject of today's uh, webinar, is the Gulf area. So, first of all, I mean, Gulf countries are dominating the OEPIC, this is uh, for sure. Uh, and I, we have to admit, OEPIC is a very strong organization, very strong. I mean, rarely where OEPIC was really discrepancy on their decision, but I... I mean, I, I'm following the story of the OPEC since it's created, I mean, since even uh, Yemen's time. It's, it's a very stable organization and they have a very big role to play in the oil, gas uh, market in the world. And all tentatives to create between bracket, a gas OEPIC, uh, I mean, has practically failed uh, so far. So uh, gas uh, price is always linked to the oil price. I think OEPIC is, uh, I again say, this uh, organization is doing a great job uh, to make the market uh, of the oil very clear and transparent uh, to, to the world. Uh, oil price today is in favor of all producers. So all the Gulf countries producing oil uh, gain from this price. But I know from deep decision making on them, they don't like to see the oil price that high. I mean, okay, they fine, but they don't like to they don't like to see the oil price above 90 i think they would love to have oil price between 80 and 90 because high price will encourage every uh, uh, a diversification of energy so they want to make it viable accessible and uh, they they can control it also so uh, that's my my view on opec uh, oil price uh, on gas Qatar in 2030 will be the biggest LNG. Do you hear me? Hello? Yeah, we hear you. Yeah, yeah. Yes, we hear you. Yeah. Uh, Qatar in 2030 will be the biggest LNG producer and exporter in the world. Uh, Saudi is the biggest commodity country if you include oil, gas, and minerals because the mining activity in Arab Saudi Arabia is very high, it's very big, mainly on the copper and uh, all related renewable energy. So what will be the challenges? Uh, the challenges will be continue the transition by decarbonizing all the oil and gas production, mainly using the blue hydrogen. So Saudi and UAE are really uh, big uh, investor in blue hydrogen to decarbonize the industry. Uh, and make it sustainable. And uh, I will let uh, Neymar uh, uh, talk about the ESG thing here. Uh, Qatar has to find enough hydrogen to decarbonize the LNG industry because the, the land is, is small and they need a lot of land to produce green hydrogen to decarbonize the, uh, the LNG. The LNG industry has to be decarbonized mainly with the E-Drive, which is uh, using renewable uh, energy in cooling the gas. Uh, the other challenge, uh, I mean, Oman is doing well. 
so far, and uh, they they bet on the green hydrogen transition. It's it has to go to a uh, to an FID very quickly by the right scaling. But uh, uh, we are happy what Oman is doing. I think Saudi and UAE are doing well overall. Uh, my recommendation is to preserve uh, the EPC contractors because they they the EPC contractor will building the facility to develop to to let them produce more when they needed to produce more. They suffered through uh, the uh, uh, pandemic uh, period. And uh, today it's, it's quite a bit uh, hard to, to recover. And when the, the, the world is asking the Gulf and the OPEC to increase the production by three, four or five million, I don't think it's not a button to push. There are a lot of investment which has not been done during the pandemic. So increasing the production drastically by two, three million, I think it will be a serious challenge. Uh, uh, I don't like to say I don't believe. So, um, uh, questions, and we'll end with my, my talk. Uh, the question I put to everyone actually on the table, will Iran come to the market with the heavy quantities as uh, they are announcing uh, on, the, on the media? I personally technically think no. Uh, they, they have to do and to, uh, come to up to speed on matter of investment. Uh, the other question, how Iraq will deal uh, with the Russian big producer in their land, actually, they are one of the biggest producers, I think there are two in Iraq, and how they will deal with the, after the outcome of the war. Uh, so uh, the answer of this, I don't know really, and uh, this is we have to monitor very, very seriously. So I think uh, I, 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 I put the introduction on the table, Najib, and uh, I, I, I let you do the transition to Nimal to continue on what I'm saying, and then I'm open for any question later on. Thank you so much, dear Ahmed. That's very, very interesting. And you covered the three sub-regions. And uh, just to clarify, maybe when you were talking about OPEC, you sound like OAPEC. So it's it, OAPEC, yes. It's, it's OAPEC. OAPEC or OPEC? Yes. Uh, it's uh, uh, OPEC, the, uh, the producing organization of petroleum uh, producers. Yeah, because there is OPEC as well, which is the organization of Arab. Uh, no, no, OPEC, OPEC. I'm talking about OPEC. That's, yes. that's clear. That's clear. Thank you so much yes. again, Ahmed, for this very insightful and very uh, important uh, uh, statement and uh, uh, that's elaborated on the. Uh, impact of the uh, uh, crisis in Ukraine uh, on our uh, region. Of course, you uh, touch on upon its uh, ramifications or global ramifications. We will uh, get back to you with uh, further questions. Uh, I'm sure after uh, we hear the second second speaker, uh, Mr. Nimal Vali Puram, who is, uh, whom I have to thank particularly because he is now in the States and uh, he had to wake up uh, this early to uh, join us. Vali Puram, uh, you have the floor. We are all ears, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, sir. This is Nimal Vali Puram. I am an ESG specialist and investor, advisor to companies and so on. I'd like to thank Najib Frihi from IP Mina to invite me here as well as Imad who I've come to know lately. And thank you for your time, ladies and gentlemen. Right now in 2022, we have two major topics right in front of us. Number one is that, where are we going to get the energy we need right now? And how are we going to fit this into the ESG transition, which we have been focusing on the last many, many years? Uh, these two, issues in some cases might contradict with each other, but it has to be answered for our sake. We have no other choice about this. We have to find a way to deal with these two issues. In terms of ESG transition, it's a question of how fast we need to do this. We have a net zero target by 2050, that's about 28 years, which is not a lot of time, but at the same time, we have today facing an extraordinary situation. I never in my life thought that I would hear the phrase war in Europe. We actually have a situation where there's a war in Europe 
and the rest of the Western and the Eastern European countries are waiting for 5 million refugees. Last year, if I had mentioned to you, this would be such a possibility, you would have said no. Here we are in 2022 spring, we have the situation. It has appended almost all calculations we have had in terms of energy, as well as every other aspect of the global economy. Russia is a huge country in terms of commodity and has a population of 140 million people with a GDP between 1.5 to $2 trillion. When you cut Russia out of the system, financially and otherwise, that's going to be felt significant changes in other countries. And I think Emmett covered it exceptionally well in terms of supply, how this is going to impact their customers for oil and gas. Let me focus on how I think it's going to play out today when it comes to ESG. I do believe that current thinking in many quarters of ESG is somewhat more, I would say, accelerated. And given what we see today in terms of high energy prices for the existing energy modalities in terms of oil and gas, I'm not sure the transition cost could be borne as we are seeing today. I've seen estimates, there are all kinds of estimates, but I've seen estimates up to a full ESG transition worldwide would cost us, believe it or not, 200 trillion US dollars. That is twice the number of global GDP activity globally every year. Given that what we have come out, we have come out of two years where we have done everything worldwide to help our population who have been impacted by pandemic. Can we continue to raise money to support this transition? As I said, we have no choice. The challenge we have is that how do we do this transition? As I said, I, I like to give you an example. We have two ships here. Think about Noah's Ark. We're in an ocean, two ships. We have to go from one ship to the other ship. That's our challenge. 7.5 billion people. Either we can blow up the existing ship because it is polluting the environment and go to the other ship. Can you imagine what would happen to the people? Or we can do the transition more intelligently. I think the second option is the only option we have. To the extent that we have to manage our existing energy assets, oil and gas in a way, we do not drive the cost of the existing use of energy too much. Besides, we cannot have what I call it an advanced economy solution to a world problem, as I think Najib mentioned it, we also have to worry about what the less developed countries are going to do in this term. All of this have to be born into the equation we have. Coming back to Europe specifically, Western European countries who are dependent on mostly Russian gas have to find a way to some extent to feel more comfortable what they are going to do. I think Emmett covered it. North Africa will play a, a bigger role uh, in terms of gas as well as electricity. There was a plan 10 years ago to build a massive solar farm in Sahara. Those plans will come back. People will consider such plans, which 10 years ago was considered to be outlandishly humongous. People will start thinking about it. North Africa is in an excellent position to supply some of the security to Western, uh, Western Europe. And we will see countries like Qatar and even Iran, if there is a solution to the current problem, will become larger suppliers. Gas is going to remain the transition fuel. There's no, there's no other way around it. 
We are going to see the transition happening to electric vehicles. We are going to see transition happening to solar and wind. We are going to see transition happening to green hydrogen, maybe through blue hydrogen, but natural gas will continue to be a transition fuel. Finally, before I take the question, I want to say something. There's another issue we have had, we having, which we have to sort it out to do the transition. That is, I, I talked to Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Glassenberg, Ivan Glassenberg, who is the CEO of Glencore, who is probably one of the most informed men when it comes to mining. And he informed me in a call that uh, existing production of lithium, copper, cobalt, nickel, graphite, all of them have to increase in multiples annually for the next 30 years. That means we have to spend enormous amount of time on mining. I think you might mention that Saudi Arabia is doing it. Many other countries, this would give a number of opportunity to North Africa and Middle Eastern countries to choose which one of these they can play in. In summary, what's going to happen is that we are going to achieve the ESG, but we are going to do it more intelligently with a more sophisticated sense without increasing the near to intermediate term cost for people for their energy use. Right now, unfortunately, given the geopolitical situation that most of the focus on the energy, uh, on the top policymakers are going to be on how to bring the cost down on oil and gas and how to make them more available. But eventually we will get to the ESG. I have tried to give you the challenges we will face uh, in the next 30 years to get there. And uh, I think with that, I will uh, conclude my remarks here and open the floor for questions, if you have any questions on this. Again, thank you for your time and patience and thank you for Mr. Furi and Imad for, for the invitation. Thank you, Nimal. That's uh, an outstanding uh, uh, presentation. Uh, you and Ahmed, uh, I mean, uh, put, uh, refocused the uh, picture uh, despite the gloomy uh, landscape uh, in this uh, part of the world and beyond. Um, uh, uh, there are, of course, some reassuring uh, remarks and elements in both your uh, statements as you uh, uh, highlighted the uh, alternatives that are uh, there. And as uh, we all agree that uh, in each challenge, uh, there is a, 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 an opportunity. And uh, I think you highlighted these opportunities quite eloquently. I uh, thank you both. And I would like to uh, open the floor for any remarks and uh, questions from uh, the diplomats, the ambassadors, and media, uh, and, and others. Uh, I'd like to thank all these embassies that have uh, participated, that are participating in this uh, 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 webinar, and uh, uh, encourage all to put any questions to uh, our speakers. Yes. Uh, Mr. Francis de Silva raised his hand. Yes, please do. Go ahead, my friend. Right. Uh, uh, good morning and thank you very much. Uh, my question is to the uh, panelists. Uh, you've seen in the recent uh, uh, day or so that uh, the government of Saudi has shown interest in, in supplying oil to China and, and the payments to be made in the Chinese Yuan. Uh, do we expect the other OPEC countries to follow suit? And what could be the geopolitical and economic impact on this to the US and the US allies? Who would like to take this question? Uh, shall we start with the IMED and then uh, uh, Nimal will follow up. Uh, 
A, I, we, we have to be sure this will happen. I, I'm not totally sure this can, uh, will happen anyway. But if it happens, it has, it has to have some commercial sense. It's the commercial exchange balance between the two countries. If uh, I think China is exporting to everywhere, and I'm not sure how much Saudi is importing actually from China, but if there is, if there is really a balance which can, which can uh, justify such kind of, uh, of trade using uh, the Chinese one uh, versus uh, oil and gas, uh, uh, this is, can happen. I don't think this is a very sustainable system uh, for a long time, and I doubt. Uh, I doubt personally. I have no opinion, uh, uh, but I doubt personally that the other OPEC country will follow this. Thank you. That's yes. my answer. Uh, yes. Please unmute. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I would like to answer the question, but I have to. Can you hear me? Yes, of course. Okay, um, I would like to say a couple of things before. Number one, I'm not a geopolitical analyst. And number two is that I'm not, uh, I am a US, US citizen. So I have a, a skin in the game, so to speak. So um, I believe that when uh, President Joe Biden decided to use the economic sanctions against uh, Russia in this particular case, I think this must have gone through their top advisor's mind. That's uh, if they must have thought about it. And I also believe that despite uh, many comments by media, uh, the China, if they had wanted to see, think that US might use US dollar uh, as a weapon in case of a situation like this, they must have thought about this a long time ago. They probably did not wait till uh, 24th of February to find that. But in this particular case, um, as Imad said, either it's a symbolic or does it make, uh, economically make sense for Saudi to do that? I am not 100% sure. But I really don't think, can, in conclusion, that what happened in the last three weeks is going to significantly change the situation in people using US dollar as a reserve currency. But I do believe that um, what had happened has made the kind of cat out of the bag, so to speak, and other countries would watch this situation in the future closely because there is a possibility that this could happen. And uh, that cannot be discounted. You are right. But I, I am not too sure that uh, what happened in the last three weeks is going to make a major difference is how the, trade is, the, the trades are being executed around the world in terms of US dollar and other currencies. I don't believe so. Thank you so much. Nimal, uh, that's quite uh, an ample uh, answer uh, to a very uh, important question that remains posed. Uh, any other questions? Yes, please, the, uh, Your Excellency from the Turkish Embassy, please uh, unmute yourself. Thank you for the panelists uh, to have such an uh, important conversation with us. Uh, I, I just wondered the answer of the Mr. Imad's question. Uh, will Iran entering into the uh, market with uh, the negotiations in Vienna, uh, the Ukrainian crisis will affect the negotiations in Vienna? Uh, what do you think, Mr. Imad, uh, about your question? Actually, thank you so much. Thank you. I'll uh, follow up uh, on that question. Uh, uh, if you don't mind, both uh, Imad and uh, uh, my friend Nimal. Uh, now that the Turkish uh, diplomat uh, Seyma uh, put uh, a question regarding the uh, ramifications of this conflict in the uh, MENA uh, region, uh, immediate neighbors, I will ask how uh, this uh, crisis will affect Turkey itself as it is on the uh, one hand, the, uh, a member of NATO, uh, a regional power uh, through which traffic uh, goods are channeled uh, as it covers more than two or three seas. Uh, this will uh, also enlighten us in the, uh, to further 
uh, clarify the uh, picture. Uh, this question is uh, to Ahmed and uh, Imal, and also to Sema if she wants to uh, add a few things on that. Thank you. Ahmed. Uh, can, I, can I take this? Yes. Yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, to uh, on Iran, my commands. It's only technically. I have. I. I mean, I have no idea what's going on on the negotiation between uh, the U.S. and uh, Iran and all the community about the nuclear. But my 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 issue is purely technical. Uh, I give you just an example. You understand the the gas field that Qatar is producing and LNG and become one of the biggest in the world is actually shared between Qatar and Iran. But see what Qatar is doing out of it and what Iran is almost doing nothing about it. It's because of the embargo, because of the technical uh, the capability that they need to develop all this. My, 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 my answer is I doubt that technically in a short time, Iran can put more two or two uh, million barrel on the market. I really doubt about it. It's a pure technical uh, uh, opinion. Uh, on uh, Turkey, a uh, few, uh, I think few days ago, uh, 10 days ago, I wrote something about it. And I think uh, Turkey is one of the most, uh, uh, how, how to say, uh, will profit from the actual situation on a commercial basis. Because all the transit uh, from the Black Sea to the Med Sea, and from Russia and from Ukraine is going through the Turkish water. And uh, uh, first of all, so they will have access to all monitoring uh, what's going on on the trade. And if there are some sanction action on the European countries in East Mediterranean, I talk about uh, Greece, Cyprus, uh, uh, Italy, and even the North African countries, uh, I think the only country which can really switch and help these countries to supply the the refined product is Turkey, uh, with their uh, refinery capability and uh, on the Med and on the Black Sea. So uh, I think Turkey is is uh, is uh, I mean it's in a good position. That's my my interpretation. Hi, this is Namal. If I may say, uh, just a comment on that. In terms of Turkey, I don't have much to add on that. But in terms of your first question regarding Iran, I think uh, it is about commodity pricing. Commodity is priced based on futures, what the future expectation is. And what the US government has done, as all of you will know that uh, when this started, uh, according to what I have read, is that they have tried to talk to Venezuela and Iran about uh, supplying the market because the Russian supply is taken out of the market. And as we know, the oil price has shot up to 130. And there were market participants talking about oil price, a barrel go to 200. As, as clearly Imad said that at 130 and beyond, you're talking about demand destruction. There will be replacement. So it's not sustainable. But US probably did not want, and other countries did not want to see oil even at 130. It's probably between 80 and 90. So I think that when it comes to Iran, it's not a question of how much they can supply, whether they can, add, they can come to some conclusion with the existing outstanding issues with the US and the rest of the uh, European Union and United Nations. And will that help the oil prices, future prices come down? That seems to be the case here, rather than actually seeing the supply come into the market. Because as Imad said, the actual supply coming into the market would take time. Uh, Qatar and other countries have spent enormous amount of money investing on technology and ability to supply gas and oil, which unfortunately Iran has not been able to do so and to be actually able to pass into the market. But that expectation will continue to play into the future's prices. But I also don't know what exactly happening in Vietnam regarding this negotiation. This has been going on for some time. Thank you, both of you. And uh, if the, uh, I would say, the substitutes to the uh, players who are leaving the pitch 
uh, will take some time, as uh, Nimal and uh, Ahmed said. How long will it take, Ahmed, uh, the uh, alternative, uh, alternative, uh, uh, the resort to alternative uh, renewable energy and clean energy will take, although you mentioned the uh, achievements done by uh, uh, registered in Morocco, in Egypt, Jordan, and uh, uh, the, the Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia are, uh, and others are uh, geared towards uh, uh, adding the uh, renewable energy to the uh, conventional one. So uh, uh, as a matter of speculation, maybe, but this is to uh, uh, get an insight on uh, how long will we uh, cope with this crisis? How long will it take uh, until we uh, get aware uh, that there is a need, a bad need to uh, think uh, seriously about the future of uh, renewable clean energy sources? That's a very important question. I think uh, if, if the time remains for that, uh, we, we have to address this question. Let's make it clear, Najib and all attendees' excellences, when 100 uh, barrel is produced in the world, 50 goes to transportation. 50% of the oil and gas goes to transportation, which means cars, trains, planes, and so on and so on. And the other and the remaining, most of it go to power, electricity. So addressing the power and electricity itself by renewable energy, this is, I think, it's in a good track for the moment. And even the countries in the Gulf, I, I'm talking highly about what Saudi is doing, UAE is doing, because I know what they are doing. Uh, does not mean the other are not doing, but I know this that they are doing. At least they switch desalination, uh, water desalination for water scarcity using the renewable energy. It's a good decision. And we have, even it's more expensive, but it's a good decision. So this is a switching and changing power and putting some renewable on your power grid. This is a good track. I think the track is still very slow, but it will take years and years. But you know, there is a shortcut uh, uh, promoted these last uh, weeks, last month, is nuclear. Nuclear as electricity are probably as a game changer for power supply, mainly in Europe, instead being uh, really in, in the neck of, uh, of the Russian gas or whoever's gas. Okay, uh, nuclear is a cheap uh, electricity, it's a cheap power actually in the grid. But when you take the historical background of nuclear power plants, they all faced capex issue. They start with a budget of 10, they finish with 100. So there is a serious capex issue with uh, really generally making the, the nuclear uh, producing power plant. I, I think there are countries now in Europe, like French is leading this because they have the technology, they are some of the paradigm of uh, the nuclear weapon. Uh, driver. Germany is against it. But now people are thinking about all of this. Uh, that is a serious uh, risk on nuclear. Uh, we, I, I'm, I'm not a fan, actually. I'm uh, more on, uh, uh, on, uh, on uh, renewable, uh, uh, meeting and mitigating the climate change by uh, the CO2 sequestration on the ground, what they're doing, the guys with the blue hydrogen, uh, using uh, or the green hydrogen using the solar and the wind. I uh, think that's probably the right trend until we find something else. But uh, this Najib, it will resolve only the power, only the power. It's not yet for transportation. And uh, and as nuclear is the solution, I, uh, I'm not a fan. That's a personal opinion. I was trying to be... Uh, I, I try to be, I try to be, uh, you know, brief here. I think uh, Ahmed is correct about that, and I think that, uh, but there are going to be some problems because I think if you ask me how the transition is going to happen in the near term, I have heard people say it will accelerate the transition, 
I think you're right. I think the need is there, but how, how, however, it's like the spirit is strong, but the flesh is not. So we need the money to do that. And I think right now people are going to worry about how much money they're going to pay for oil and gas, mm -hmm. then jumping into this. Uh, clearly that this is already showing to policymakers that we have to go, we have to go green. There's no way around it. And, uh, but in addition to what you said about power, I, I do, I, I am pretty optimistic about the electric cars. I think the things are moving pretty fast on that. We, we are probably are not seeing worldwide, but in other countries, we are seeing more advanced countries. It'll, we will probably get to see that. But uh, near term, I think the, the, the focus will be on how to get the existing oil prices, oil and gas prices down more than anything else. But I said in my initial comments, I'm a huge fan of ESG transition and it will continue to happen. And there are a number of technologies out there we will have that. Uh, before I uh, go, I just said uh, two people who have asked a question. I think Maggie Nadi from US Embassy, she had a, might have had a question and also Mr. Naman from uh, GDN as well, basically. I just saw them raise their hand. So I just would like to give them some time if possible. Thank you. I, I already took note of that and I was planning to give the floor to Naman and then to Maggie. And Naman, you have the floor. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, so my question is uh, based on uh, Mr. Imad's uh, comment about uh, the high prices encouraging diversification. Um, so I just wanted to so get some clarification on this. Uh, so yes, high prices uh, would encourage people to diversify into, say, renewables or other gas sources, but uh, the high prices also would provide uh, capital for uh, projects like the offshore platforms. Uh, so what's the kind of time frame we have uh, before people uh, start switching to renewables? Um, you know, we're looking, uh, we have a few projects, especially in Bahrain, where we have the offshore oil reserves. Uh, would uh, the oil price, uh, the high oil prices not provide more capital for us to develop those? I think I think uh, Naman's uh, question uh, represents uh, lots of uh, players, even from the states. The resort of the what you call uh, the rock uh, uh, oil and uh, uh, other uh, forms of uh, uh, fossil uh, sources of energy. And just a reminder, uh, Naman is. Uh, uh, the uh, journalist or reporter of the Gulf Daily News, the leading uh, English uh, newspaper in Bahrain. Shall I, shall I answer? Yeah, please do. Yeah. Now, man uh, and all, actually, the enemy number one for renewable energy is cheap oil price. Because when you have cheap oil price, so cheap gas mm. price, people will go straight to oil and gas. In order to develop renewable, clean, diversify other things, the oil price has to be a bit high. So when you are in front of a choice to make, apple for apple, even if it's more expensive when it's renewable, you'll go for renewable. But if the difference is like 60% difference or 70% difference per, per kilowatt hour, I'm talking about power, you will go for cheap. You will, there is no way and a sustainable economy will choose. So they have to go high prices in order to, but if you go too high, 130, 150, I survived 150, 2013, then the renewable will be cheaper than oil and gas. And the countries will switch to do something else. So uh, uh, for, for your case in Bahrain, I mean, FID, it's, it's, it's based on CapEx platform offshore. I don't know how much it would cost, how much you're going to produce, how many oils, mm -hmm. and you will have your break-even number, uh, which I'm sure the guys in Bahrain knows. That's why it does not make it. But the good thing about Bahrain, I have the information. They want to do green hydrogen. I don't know where and why and where, but I'm sure there is a political decision to do it. So, And I'm glad to hear this. Yes, and you might want to follow up or? Yes, yes, yes. I think I, I, I have, I know, and that's an excellent question. And I think that the biggest problem for um, the clean energy is going to be 
is oil prices and gas prices at a certain price, which makes it attractive for customers to use. And it also makes it attractive for their companies to make enough money so they can throw around the money. So I think that oil at uh, 80 to $90 would be a lovely number for them where it will make the oil prices attractive to customers at the same time to make the companies to generate so much cash, they can look at uh, projects which they have not done be, uh, uh, b b just before. Uh, on the other sense that um, uh, I've talked to a, a very reputed oil um, forecasting firm and uh, they have indicated that last year, oil capex worldwide was about $100 billion. And going forward, that number is going to come down to uh, 20, 30 plus, it's going to go down to $50 billion. But I think what we have seen with Russia and what, what is happening here in terms of uh, shale companies and the US talking to Venezuela and Iran, those declines from 100 billion to anything going forward will be somewhat less in my opinion, because for the time being, countries will look at more at energy securities than going green. As I said before, this is going to be a very, very complicated balancing uh, situation we have to do because ESG transition is a must. We have to get it done. But at the same time, we can go bankrupt doing that. And this is the biggest challenge we are going to face. Thank you so much. Now, Maggie, you have the floor. Yes. My friend. Maggie, we can't hear you. Maggie, we cannot hear you. We can't hear you. We can't hear you, Maggie. Yeah, I think she's trying to fix it. One second. Mm -hmm. No. Any, uh... we can't hear you. Hello? Do you want to try typing your question, Maggie? Or? Please put it in uh, our uh, chat. In the meantime, Naman, you have a follow-up question or? Uh... Uh, Maggie, according to the uh, screen, it says you are not mute. So we should hear you. And now you are mute. You are not mute now. Now you're not mute, Maggie. Yeah. I think it's a technical issue, yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. That's such a pity. Can you type your... Uh, she put it in the chat. It's too long. Too long. <laughs> okay. Uh, I oh, think it's a uh, sorry? The yeah, Bangladesh man? No, the Bangladesh ambassador has a... Comment. Bangladesh ambassador, please do, Your Excellency. Uh, can you hear me? I, we I can hear you loud and clear. Oh, and thank you. And um, perhaps Maggie will be trying to come back. Uh, uh, thank you for arranging this uh, very important topic of discussion, energy security and beyond. Uh, my question to both panelists, and already both of them covered for renewable energy, and I would like to try uh, to connect it with uh, climate change, and uh, Imad has also mentioned, and we have seen in Glasgow uh, just last, uh, I think, October, November, the negotiation, and there, there was, uh, you know, target by all countries, and particularly those who are fossil uh, oil producer countries. And as uh, Imad also uh, said that both Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Emirates, they are moving towards that. And uh, as Nimal also mentioned that this is a, a very critical balance. But uh, uh, if even the war is not happening, uh, we are actually, as a climate vulnerable country, Bangladesh, we urge international community to have, uh, you know, reducing emissions uh, so that uh, in future, Bangladesh, we foresee that uh, if climate change is happening and temperature rises, and there will be uh, millions of people displaced uh, due to climate change. So. It is a very a pertinent uh, issue now. And uh, I, I think uh, this war has uh, given a wake up call for a whole international community that uh, if uh, renewable energy uh, you know, program is accelerated, 
then everybody will be safer because we should not be relying on uh, you know few people who are supplying and uh, what i meant you uh, everybody understand and uh, other day actually yesterday in fact i was listening cnn uh, one interview given by andrew forrest uh, many of you know him he is a australian uh, linear and he was talking about this also that uh, if uh, renewable energy is uh, much ex accelerated then it would have not been uh, that scenario of reliance or, uh, on a certain country for uh, energy security so uh, I put this question in the context of climate change and also that uh, uh, climate negotiation in the inter international community. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Nazir, for giving me a chance to uh, you know, participate. Thank you. My pleasure, Your Excellency, my friend. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I, I'll take the question first, yes, and, and uh, just saying uh, thank you for your question, Your Excellency. I think it's a very, very important question. Just to put this in perspective, I actually grew up in Sri Lanka north of Sri Lanka. Some of the islands I grew up as a child are probably going to disappear come 2050. And I studied in India and I have been to Sundarban, one of the most beautiful places in the world. And that's what you meant where people will start losing the land. Um, I'm very much aware of that basically. And some of these countries are going to lose out far more than other countries. And another problem is that we also have to come up with solutions to uh, you know, climate issues which are more applicable, equally applicable to all the countries. Uh, we cannot have, we cannot be selling electric cars for $100,000 in Norway. There are then too many people in the world who are going to buy electric cars for $100,000. That's not a practical solution. Um, so after given that, yes, I think what we have seen so far is clearly going to put a gun on people's head, if I may use that uh, phrase. But um, had we been not taken care of this issue, that probably would be more relevant. But in the last two or three years, we really have accelerated this ESG transition issue and there is a sense of urgency. And clearly what's happening right now will uh, uh, put this in front of people even more so. But again, the issue is that how are we going to allocate the resources? How are we going to spend the money we have to do this? This should not, under any circumstances, decelerate or make the change less urgent. Clearly, what has happened today in the last three weeks should make it far more urgent than it was before. As you correctly said, Your Excellency, that uh, there are countries which will lose out in a massive scale with the climate change. And we have to be on top of that. And I, I want to pass it on to Ahmed in terms of green hydrogen or any other comments he would have in this. Uh, I think, uh, thanks Nimal, His Excellency, uh, your, your wake up call, uh, I mean, it's it goes straight to our heart because we, we are aware of all of this. Uh, we are facing a couple of things. There's a financial problem. Is how to raise money to finance green projects in a, in a, in a, in a climate change objective and convincing people to pay a more higher or more expensive energy. They, they, they should be a mechanism, especially for countries like yours without uh, big resources, uh, but with a huge capability to convert to renewable energy. It's one of the key thing is really financing all these projects. So uh, uh, this is still on the table. We struggle with financing all of this. There are, I mean, the only structured uh, organization in financing this, but they are subsidizing this is Europe. Uh, and in the US, California is doing great job, mainly on a, on a grid direction as, uh, as a state. Uh, so this is, uh, this is, I think, the biggest challenge that you are facing and is, is really getting uh, uh, the event. The other thing is, and I think I have to highlight it, uh, for, for years, all new renewable energy was fighting the oil and gas companies and 
saying and uh, attacking them by saying that the polluter and they have to pay, they have to stop and they have, they have to do something. No, there is a big, actually an investment in renewable energy and clean energy is really financed by oil and gas companies. When you see a company like BP, it will be 100% out of CO2 by 2030, I think, on their objective. See the conversion of Shell, see the conversion of ENI. Most of them are today investing on renewable energy. And I think now the speed of investing on renewable energy become much higher because the oil companies, mainly the major, are really investing on this. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, while waiting for uh, Maggie to fix her uh, audio uh, issues, I see two uh, uh, staff members there. Uh, Maggie, are you back with us? Can you hear me now? Oh, yes. Perfect. Perfect. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I apologize for that. And uh, this is and uh, Maggie Nardi from the U.S. Embassy. She's the charge of affair. I should say crystal clear. Okay, thank you. And uh, I, I hope that uh, my questions won't disappoint you with not being uh, interesting enough. But I was um, thinking back in the last few months uh, before the current situation with Ukraine, uh, there had been a request to the OPEC plus uh, countries to increase production by at least 400,000 barrels a day. So that was months ago. Uh, my understanding is that uh, while there was that agreement, some of the countries uh, haven't been able to achieve uh, that level of increase. So my question to the panelists is, would that even really make a difference? Sh should it be possible to do? Would it make a difference? And if not, is there a level of increase that would, would make even a dent in the prices now? And related to that, I was wondering if you can, uh, give your thoughts on whether 80 or $90 a barrel is the correct price now for the current supply and demand situation, or if it's still too high based on speculation or um, controls that are be play being placed by the producers. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. So uh, I meant, yes. Start? Yeah. Yes. On the first question, um, I personally think would not change anything. I mean, they will be diluted actually in the market. The four, 500,000 barrel day for all OPEC will not really affect anything in the market. At least you can see a, a trough or a small peak, but then will be, will be flat as the market can absorb all these quantities. That is after the COVID uh, high demand actually, and it's, it's continuing to be a high demand. And as I started my my talk uh, this morning, uh, I said uh, the gas price uh, in Europe uh, picked in a very high uh, way that it never reached on the, in the previous history, actually. If you convert uh, gas to, an, uh, to a barrel of oil, it reached like $280 a barrel of gas equivalent. So gas was very expensive in October in Europe, in the UK. That is the shortage of... Uh, uh, of, of gas and uh, uh, the market is absorbing all what uh, what uh, the OPEC can OPEC plus can add uh, but I don't think technically they can do big numbers that's my uh, as a technical guy I don't think they can put more than this actually in the market and I don't believe there is uh, any any main reserve that they can really play with it and the fine-tuning when they add when they don't add I think the technical capability, we know it uh, everywhere. The only country probably that have some capacity is Saudi Arabia. This is uh, A. You, uh, you can't uh, also think about it only on a day basis. I mean, if you take a decision today, you will see it after nine months. That's the market. I mean, some of the oil contracts, it's yearly contract and uh, dated brand or dated whatever it is. You buy it today, you, you can deliver this nine months. So... Uh, there will be a really uh, a hedge funds uh, somewhere every week, really try to pick the price uh, in a way or another. So that's uh, my answer to the first question. And I apologize, because I forget the second question. Remind us, uh, Maggie. Yeah, the, uh, the, the, the price per barrel, if it is, if yes. it settles uh, yeah. around 90, okay. Yes, I mean, for, for me, uh, if you own this producing company, mainly the heavy producers, uh, 
produce and do CO2 sequestration to, uh, to fit with the climate change requirement of the COP26 of Glasgow and even 21. The oil price has to be in a sustainable way between, I will see 70 to 90. I am a bit wide. Uh, I think oil uh, companies uh, and government, state oil companies, in my opinion, will be have, happy with $80. And the $80 will help also the renewable energy to be sustainable and competitive for oil. That's my, my answer to you, Thank Excellency. You. Thank you. Man. Uh, yes, I, I probably will answer the question from a point of view of uh, the price expectation. I think the first question has been answered by Emmett uh, very well on the technical side. Uh, when it comes to pricing of the oil, it's a very complicated market. It actually is not a one number. And one number what we see today is the mostly spot numbers. And uh, most of the cases, we don't know what the numbers are, the actual long-term contracts. But a spot number is driven, uh, is, is actually drives the sentiment of people. So we have to focus on the spot number. I think from a, a large customer point of view, like United States or India or China, they would probably like to see oil at $60. They were probably more comfortable with that number. 60 would give them a, a sense of that they are not spending too much money on oil. But from a supplier's point of view, as you might put it, very articulately that uh, given that what we need now in terms of they have to take care of carbon capture and sequestration and other issues with oil, $80 is probably uh, they would be happy with. And you have to keep in mind, and oil has already been up for the last one year before what happened with uh, Russia and Ukraine. So expecting oil during a political crisis to go down to $60 is just not going to happen. But uh, from a customer point of view, yes, we would like to see 60, but we probably would be happy with 80. But anything more than 80 to 90, countries like United States will do everything on their power to discuss with the suppliers to bring it down. And I think the market to some extent reflect that if you look at the oil pricing in the last uh, couple of weeks or so. I, I hope that answers your question, Mike. Thank you so much, both of you. and. Uh... I think I saw GDN, uh, no, I think they left. Uh, I will uh, uh, put a kind of uh, last and uh, uh, not candid question uh, for uh, the future, uh, both to Imad and Nimal. How do you see the prospects of the gas recently uh, discovered in the East Mediterranean getting into the game in the, uh, I don't think it, uh, in the near future or uh, midterm future, but I think it will take time to get this uh, new element in the uh, uh, global uh, energy map. I answer? Of course. Uh, I'm one of uh, the first uh, people who looked at this Mediterranean when it was just a blank. I mean, nothing in there. Uh, I think there are a few, uh, few happy uh, informations, happy news. And there are some uh, disappointment also on the East gas uh, so far. Uh, I think Egypt made the jackpot on the East Mediterranean with Zornfield. It's a huge gas discovery. And... Uh, and they have FID to develop this and they will send it to LNG plant and it will feed the European market. I think that's uh, something which we have to look at it after probably three to five years. That's, uh, that's for the Met. Uh, Europe uh, is in a shortage of gas, uh, this is for sure, so they will need this. Uh, I don't think uh, Cyprus nor Lebanon or Greece have might made any big discovery. The holes drilled so far by the majors does not look encouraging. So the only really uh, gas is really offshore of Israel and uh, and uh, and Egypt. And Egypt is a very active gas market. I think for the future, we can see uh, Egypt exporting a lot of gas to Europe and probably in five, between five to ten years. And they have uh, two train of liquefied energy plants. 
the issue and the main problem is really decarbonizing. I mean, you can produce gas, you can produce LNG, but you have to decarbonize. This is a must. You cannot make any development for new gas field without any decarbonization plan. And this has to be widespread everywhere. And there are expertise. We can, we can, we can, we can, I mean, Neymar, ESG, he can talk about it longly. I mean, we were in, I was in the US a couple of weeks ago, and that's the discussion. ESG, decarbonization, US is the, the biggest exporter so far of LNG. So, but I, since it's the last question, I have to highlight one thing very important. On the LNG, which will be the transition front for the next 20 years, there is no more resources working on this. Kids, students, they are not willing to work on oil and gas anymore. University are begging to have students work on this. There will be a huge shortage of, uh, of, uh, of resources for the next 20 years, mainly in the US market. So combining this with e-drive, green, transition, and so that will be the only way to attract youth actually to work on the energy business, mainly in the US and all the world, because now they are mostly focusing on IT. So that will be my last sentence actually on this. Thank you. Nimal, before you put your question, I'd like to, uh, your answer, I'd like to uh, hear from uh, uh, my friend Talal, uh, uh, who uh, uh, Talal Kazim is from the uh, Ministry of Finance in Bahrain, and he is, uh, I think, he joins you in one uh, of your multiple hats, which is investment. So let's take his question, and then you 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 you, you reply to uh, uh, the last uh, question, maybe uh, together. My friend Talal, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, uh, dear uh, Najib, for uh, organizing uh, this event. And uh, really, the speakers, and including yourself, uh, are very excellent uh, uh, um, speakers and uh, the panelists. And uh, the subjects and the topics are really very, uh, very uh, profitable. And uh, it's really to it's good to hear uh, these views. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry for maybe I'm, uh, you, you close the session, but I have one point and maybe a question to the panelists. Uh, uh, regarding uh, now, uh, this is a new trend we, we are seeing, and uh, I don't know, maybe it's for a year or more than a year regarding this, the uh, uh, the uh, renewable energy or the electric uh, uh, power uh, engines and um, cars and uh, um, uh, maybe we could see other uh, uh, industries, not necessarily cars, maybe you could see uh, new uh, electric uh, uh, items, uh, including planes or I don't know, boats and maybe it can extend to uh, a lot of issues. Uh, how this uh, will impact uh, the oil price uh, going forward for mayor? Do you think this industry will uh, affect, uh, have an impact on uh, oil demand and price going forward? Uh, thank you very much. Yes, uh, this is Namal here, and I will ask, I think you might, might have an answer to that uh, question as well. And uh, just go back to uh, that particular question, I would say that over the long term, Mr. Kazim's question, over the long term, um, if the electric uh, transition is successful, as we expect it to be in a larger scale, uh, that would clearly have some impact on demand of oil and gas. Clearly, there's no question about that. But uh, one has to be careful about how long will it take. As I explained to you, there are two things which are going to electric cars, which is lithium for batteries and new metals for magnets. We are short of both of them in the sense we still have to mine them and they're still pretty expensive. But that that transition is happening already. 
in a larger scale and hopefully it will happen. And uh, to answer your particular question, yes, if that is successful, that would have some negative impact on the oil demand and thus oil prices. And this is the last comment, so I just want to go back to that, uh, that East Mediterranean uh, uh, gas this thing. And this is the, the main point I was making initially. We have to be careful about the transition. The, the, the current situation has clearly showed us the transition is a must and it has to happen. But in the near and intermediate term, we cannot make the transition too costly for us. This is the major issue. So I think in the near term, any new incremental uh, gas discoveries would be used uh, to so that people don't pay the kind of prices they paid last year in Europe for gas, since we have no other way to heat the houses right now. But um, I think in the near term, near to intermediate term, we will be looking for some, but how to balance this will be the greatest challenge faced by us. We have never seen anything like this before. And that will be the greatest challenge, which will be faced by all of you, policymakers, diplomats, politicians, leaders, scientists, intellectuals, how are we going to do this? That's the biggest challenge. And I hope we do it well for us and for our future. And with that, I'd like to thank all of you for your time and Mr. Najib Frihu for inviting me and also Imad as well. Thank you, Nimal, uh, from the uh, depth of my heart. And uh, Imad, uh, on behalf of uh, my colleagues, uh, Dalia, uh, Soraya, and Gabriel, uh, and of, uh, on behalf of uh, IPI uh, Global, you have uh, led this very important uh, event with uh, uh, professionalism, with uh, insightful uh, contributions. And uh, I think you uh, are now engaged to further follow up with us on this very important uh, issue in this very sad uh, context. But as I said earlier, uh, uh, let's uh, look for opportunities in this uh, very uh, uh, sad challenge. Uh, I will thank all of you, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, for having taken part in uh, this webinar. Uh, IPI, uh, Mina, will be uh, happy to uh, further develop on this issue and other issues related to our future, our future as we aspire for this region, more region integration and let uh, energy security be uh, a part of the engine that will uh, uh, push forward towards achieving that goal. I will thank everybody and uh, wish you uh, all the best and uh, happy weekend and wish that this conflict will be solved the soonest. And let's go back to work on uh, development, sustainable development, region integration, and build a better uh, world for our uh, uh, next generations. Thank you very much, everybody. We'll uh, see you soon.